Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, this video is going to be on deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA and the various structure and its structure. Um, so we're going to start over here on the right. Over here. This. And we'll gradually move our way over to the left get into the nitty-gritty. Um, so first, on the left side of the right, we have these molecules here. This form the phosphate backbone of DNA. DNA has three components. Um, I'll type them out here. The phosphate backbone, is negatively charged because the oxygen molecules and the phosphate together are negative. Um, if we look at the electrons um, that I have not drawn here, that's so my apologies, um, but that's in another video. We'll do electrons and the octet rule and all that confirmation and resonance structures, but we'll do that in another video. For now, we're just going to work worry about the basic structure of DNA. So here we have the um, basic phosphate backbone group. As you can see, the phosphates hold together the DNA. This is like the right side of it, so our, or the perimeter of the DNA. So as we know, DNA is a double helix. So it kind of looks something like that goes back and forth so I'm free hand in this right now this is not my best work and you have the rungs they're always portrayed like this but more accurately they're probably separated like that and you got bonds in the middle holding them together but they're usually portrayed like this just as one solid rung so the outside of this is where these phosphate backbones come in they hold the DNA's double helix structure together oh while we're talking about this I'm gonna give you a little bit of history um, Rosalind Franklin was a female and very accomplished scientist who made her name at very prestigious institutions um, one of them being King's College I know she was in Cambridge for a minute um, very accomplished but her contribution to DNA was that she did x-ray crystallography and x-ray diffraction techniques which is where you use light and she used x-rays and she used the angle of incidence to calculate the angle of diffraction um, using various formulas and equations uh, to basically map out the perimeter and the structure of DNA so she knew that it was somewhat helical um, and she basically proved it through her images. She did thousands, hundreds of images, I want to say. Um, she eventually passed away from cancer in 1958, and people think it's largely due in part to the fact that she dealt with x-rays. So She took so many x-ray photos. Um, it's likely to cause DNA damage, but we'll, we'll go into that in another video as well, because that's actually my specialization cancer and oncology DNA damage reacted to oxygen species and um, uncontrolled proliferation but we'll talk about that in another video I'm excited for that video personally um, so yeah she passed away in 1958 due to cancer um, and James Watson and Francis Crick um, now the history is a little bit foggy some say they stole her work um, since I wasn't there 100 years ago, I can't really 
say what happened, but I just wanted to make sure I mentioned Rosalind Franklin first so that she got her credit. Um, but then Watson and Crick um, took her model and flipped it so that this strand has the phosphate backbone going um, like up like this direction and then this one this this helix right here is going this direction so they're anti-parallel um, before this gets too cluttered I'm going to start undoing some of this um, yeah so they're anti-parallel so that's where the history comes in Rosalind Franklin and James Watson and Francis Crick they should all get credit and there's probably a bunch of scientists who set the foundation for that beforehand but this isn't a history lesson this is a biology lesson so there's a phosphate backbone the next component we're gonna have here is called the rebose the rebose so the rebose is a sh five carbon sugar so you have one two three four five five carbons connected to an oxygen mo molecule within the cyclic compound the rebose in deoxyribose is um, noted by a hydrogen bond right here um, in RNA which we'll talk about in another video um, it has the hydroxyl group here so when it's DNA deoxy think no oxy so there's no oxygen here um, that's the main difference um, that and uracil but again another video we have plenty of time let's not complicate this more than we have to so rebose that's the second component so now we have a phosphate backbone and we have a ribose sugar and we established that the ribose sugar is different from the deoxyribose sugar. So the deoxyribose sugar does not have the oxygen and the hydrogen on this two. It's this second um, carbon here. If you want to count carbons, it's one, two. Um, we'll have the, let's do this, just type it out, make it really easy. One. So this is carbon one, this is carbon two. On deoxyribonucleic acid, there is no oxygen on the second carbon but in RNA the ribonucleic acid there is the hydroxyl group there which is noted by the oxygen and the hydrogen on the second carbon this video is about DNA deoxyribonucleic acid so there is no hydroxyl group if you remember that you'll be all right now we get into the the fun part about this DNA uh, the base so the base is where the transcription actually comes in so as we talked about the central dogma of biology we talked about um, DNA gets transcribed into mRNA so what does that mean so DNA is coded for by these nucleotides. Nucleotides are different from nucleosides because nucleotides have the phosphate backbone we were talking about. They're part of DNA. Um, DNA is encoded by chromatin. 
and cells can replicate because of their DNA. Um, a large section of DNA can code for genes, and these genes can in turn be um, transcribed and activated. So they can be activated, and then gene transcription can occur um, to make mRNA, and then subsequently into proteins. So these different DNA nucleo, um, these bases, these nucleotides, nucleotide bases, are transcribed. But these are essentially the most pure form of biological instruction, our machinery that we have in ourselves. These four basically encode of all life. Excuse me. And by rearranging the order, our cell can basically create new proteins that can execute different functions. Cells and thus organisms exist. That's a little bit vague and very filled with holes, but. We're just going over the basics in this video. We'll go more in depth as we get further along this journey. So first, guanine. Guanine is a purine because it has two rings. I like to think of this as like one, two, two. It is a purine because if I had pure gold rings, I'd want two instead of one. Um, that's how I remember it. Um, feel free to come up with your own mnemonic or memory device. Um, I just have always liked gold, so <laughs> that's what I chose. So purine means it has two rings and the other purine is going to be adenine. So if you look at this, A and G, adenine and guanine. On the periodic table, AG is silver. And that's another thing. You can have silver rings. Um, so however you want to memorize that, um, whichever way comes easier to you, that's a good way to do it. Another thing I just remembered that I forgot to put on these things is that there's electrons on all of these. Um, they're significant, and we'll get into them later. Um, also, there's a hydrogen missing here. I'm sorry guys, it's a little bit late. Yes. Okay, so there's a hydrogen there, and there's also electrons, so. Put those there. Okay. So, guanine and adenine, those are purines. Um, they can form three hydrogen bonds. So, adenine and guanine, I like to think of as purines. Um, no, so I misspoke there. Adenine and guanine are purines and they have two rings. Cytosine and... Oh my goodness. Cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines. So let me actually spell that out. So... visual learners out there. 
cytosine has one ring and it is a pyrimidine. That's how you spell it. Um, pyrimidine. Thymine is also a pyrimidine. So, the way I learned it, um, was I was just like, oh, it's not appearing. <laughs> but for those who want a mnemonic, you can think of it as pi. So PY, like a slice of pie. It's not the same, but it's kind of the same. And if you want a slice of pie, you only want one slice of pie, because, you know, we we not about that. You know, we like to monitor our macros and our calorie intake. So, you know, cytosine and pyrimidine, or cytosine and thymine. Um, and uh, cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines. Um, and uracil is two, which is an RNA, which honestly I should probably have done this together. Um, but I'll probably just make a small video and I'll just be like, make sure you see part two. Um, part two would be RNA, but uracil, we'll just, um, add that real quick down here. Uracil. is also a pyrimidine. So it's got one ring, which I'll show you in the, uh, in a following video. Probably do RNA next to them, to be honest. Um, and so you want a cut of pi. So one ring is pyrimidine. Purines have two rings. Adenine, guanine, silver, two rings. Cytosine, uracil, and thymine are pyrimidines, one ring. However you want to remember that is, you know, as you learn more about it, you'll figure out better ways to memorize things. I like to come up with as many connections to um, the correct answer as possible, um, just because neuroscience um, works by strengthening connections when you have more than one way of connecting to it. I think it's called spreading activation, but I'm not sure. Um, so, now, we get to the fun part. The next thing you're going to need to know is hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are, if you remember that um, DNA double helix I drew earlier, Hydrogen bonds hold together the middle rungs. So I drew two bonds connected and seamless, and I drew the third one with a break in the middle. That's a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond, for all sakes and purposes, is any hydrogen molecule with an, um, what's it called? I'm blanking. Fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. So fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, or F, O, and N. And these are called hydrogen bonds. They're covalent bonds. And yeah, they're pretty strong. They hold together DNA. So, you know, they, they, gotta, they gotta be pretty strong. Um, I think ionic bonds are the only ones that are stronger, but again, <laughs> might need to double check this, um, but I hope this is useful. So hydrogen bonds are fun, quote unquote, for fluorine, fluorine, no, I'm sorry guys, I'm still getting used to this sketch pad, I might look for a better one. Um, because this might not cut it. Oxygen. And nitrogen. These 
these molecules are capable of hydrogen bonding. This is very important if you want to go into anything science related. You're going to need to know this. And they form their intermolecular forces. So they can form between different atoms. Um, and molecules. Okay. Or not atoms, different molecules, different elements. Okay. Back to the important part. So. Okay. What you're going to need to know here is that guanine and cytosine can form three. And we're going to see why in a second here. Three hydrogen bonds. Yeah, that's why I drew these like this, because I wanted it to be pretty clear that the, the hydrogen bonds part is probably the most difficult part of this. Um, not so much the purines, because you can just remember the purines are rings. They have multiple rings. Purines, multiple rings, silver, AD, AG. And then cytosine, thymine, uracil, cut. You want a cut of pi. One slice of pi. Um, so guanine and cytosine, I remember this, three hydrogen bonds, um, as golf cart. Because a golf cart has four wheels, and I just remembered that four is more than any other bonds, so it's going to be three. Um, adenine and thymine form two. Um, I thought of apple tree, so these two go together, and these two go together. Golf cart, three hydrogen bonds. Apple tree, two hydrogen bonds. Um, and you can see here why. So if you were to picture these being anti, um, well, these don't actually go together. Remember that, um, oh, they do go together. So when you're bonding the DNA and you have the double helix, oops, when you have the double helix, you have these bonds you have let's say you have guanine over here and you have cytosine over here boom um, guanine is going to have hydrogens where do my hydrogens go oh my goodness sorry about this See that guanine has three places for hydrogen bonding. It's got one, two, three. So this is where the electrons are important. Um, but again, another video because this video is getting kind of long already. So guanine and cytosine can form three. If you look here, there's two places. Um, where it can be bonded um, either here and here the other ones here because this donates to and this can um, accept to and then donate one and accept one so guanine donates two hydrogens and accepts one 
cytosine accepts two hydrogens, one, two, and donates one for a total of three. Um, if we look at adenine thymine, moving on, we see that um, adenine can give one and take one. Now, I'm not entirely sure why it can't take or take two because there is an extra one. I think it has something to do with the resonance, but I need to look uh, further into it. Um, so, thymine. You see, you can give one, and it can take one. Um, I think it has something to do with the, the anti-parallel structure, would be my guess. Um, because, see, there's some inconsistencies, like in this one. And, honestly, it might have something to do with the steric hindrance of the thymine. But, that would just be my guess. That's all speculation. Most people watching this video probably don't need to know that. Um, did you know that thymine and adenine can form two hydrogen bonds? Guanine and cytosine can form three hydrogen bonds. And so guanine and cytosine bonds can withstand higher temperatures. Um, DNA that is highly concentrated in GC bonds, or guanine or cytosine bonds. Um, can withstand, they're more stable, they are harder to denature, and they form stronger overall bonds because they have three hydrogen bonds instead of two. Adenine and thymine bonds can form, but they denature quickly at, more, at lower temperatures, and their bond strength is weaker because they only form two hydrogen bonds. Okay, so uh, we've got all that. We can do a quick review and then end this video because this video is actually much longer than I anticipated. Um, oops. Okay. So, first, we know that DNA has three components. It has a phosphate backbone, a ribose, which is a five carbon sugar. Um, deoxyribose does not have the hydroxyl group on the second carbon. Ribonucleic acid, which we'll do in the next video, does have the hydroxyl group, the OH, um, on the second carbon. We know that DNA is negatively charged because phosphate groups are negative, and we know that there's a base. So there's a phosphate backbone, a ribose sugar, and a base. Uh, we know that guanine and Adenine are purines because silver, we want more silver rings. So he doesn't want more silver. Um, so they have two. We know that cytosine, thymine, and eventually uracil, um, which we'll go over in the RNA video, is one ring because you want a cut CUT, cytosine, thymine, and uracil of pi, and you only want one ring. We know that the golf cart has more wheels than the apple tree, so guanine and cytosine have three hydrogen bonds, and adenine and thymine, the apple tree, has two hydrogen bonds. I hope this video was helpful. Um, please leave a comment below on how I can improve if you have any questions, and I will look into the um, why thymine can only um, have uh, two hydrogen bonds, even though it seems to be able to have, um, you know, an extra bonding site here, bonding site here, and bonding site here, but it only has two bonds. I gotta look into that and see if that actually has something to do with the steric hindrance. But hope this video was helpful, and thank you. Like, subscribe.